this is a common point of tension between us managing the airway and then the trauma surgeons during a, a, a severe trauma. So you have someone that's altered that clearly needs to go to the OR pretty quickly and we're looking at their blood pressure and we know that they need to be intubated and there's this tension of how quickly do you intubate because you don't want to dilly-dally forever with someone with a low GCS that desperately needs to get to the OR to, to be saved. At the same time, if you don't properly volume resuscitate, it's very easy to take that person with, with shocky blood pressures, the gunshot wound to the chest with the systolic blood pressure in the 70s, and then make them code by suddenly doing both the things that we talked about, decreasing their, their preload by forcing air into their chest, but also taking away all their catecholamine surge. So that's where you have to get appropriate, at least beginning, volume resuscitation. So is that blood in the trauma patient? Is that an appropriate bolus of fluids in the septic patient? Whatever that looks like is a very good idea if there's risk for that. The other is being ready to replace that catecholamines that you're taking away. And I think that push dose pressors are a great agent for this. So if you have someone that's even remotely shocky or that is even at high risk for it, I think that having that syringe of push dose epinephrine at one to 100,000, as we've described previously, how to, to, to make is a great thing to have because once that shock develops, if, if you're surprised by it and you don't have that ready, you really don't want to take the three minutes to mix up the syringe while your patient's either coding or about to code. Okay, so be really, really careful with that. And then I think ultrasound actually helps to make sure that you're appropriately addressing their, their heart and volume status after you tube them as well. I'd add a couple other things too before we go on. I don't know if this is going to cover some of your questions. So there's a couple other pathologies. I can think of three off the top of my head that can be what I call the intubate and dies. One is the pericardial tamponade, right? Another preload dependent lesion, right? So if you intubate somebody who's got pericardial tamponade, positive pressure ventilation, now instead of pulling blood into our chest, we're pushing blood away from our chest. Now you could potentially intubate that patient and get a cardiac arrest. Uh, another one would be attention pneumothorax, exactly the same thing slightly different pathology, right? So you got this entity within the chest that's generating this high pressure. You add some more pressure to it with the ventilator, and then all of a sudden they tip over the edge and go down. Um, and the, the third one I can think of, at least off the top of my head, would be um, uh, acidotic. Did you, is that what you just said? Yeah, right-sided MI. Right-sided MI. Yeah, that's a good mm -hmm. one. Right-sided MI, right? So, you, so again, another preload-dependent lesion because the right heart is responsible for sending blood over to the left heart. And if it's having trouble sending it over there, you need more preloads. So you give them fluid bolts to try to try to force it through there. But you add some more afterload on the right heart, right? Because you put mechanical ventilator on there. You're, at, you're, add, you're raising <coughs> your blood pressure within your lungs, if you will. Now it can't pump against that. The last one would be acidotic patient, yeah. right? So if you've if you got somebody you're about to intubate that you think might be coo smalling and you can save a little bit of time, Maybe check that pH before you put the tube in. Before you take away, why, why, why are they gonna? Why are they gonna arrest? It's not the, the act of putting them on the ventilator. Well, maybe it is if you don't ventilate them enough. But a lot of times, it's that you know they're resting at a pH of like say seven, seven point one, and then you paralyze them, and then maybe you don't have first pass success, or maybe you do. Maybe it just just you didn't have enough time, and they arrest right because that pH is gonna start dropping pretty precipitously once you take away that ability to blow off CO two. So that would be a fourth intubate and die. So um, I think ultrasound plays a big role in all of these cases. We had a trauma patient um, that we discovered had tamponade, uh, and we waited to get everything ready, get the thoracotomy tray ready, have the OR ready, the trauma surgeon was there, packaged the patient, then intubated them, make sure they were, their blood pressure held, and then sent them straight to the OR, where they coded in the OR. But they survived, because that's a better place to do a thoracotomy, right? in the OR as opposed to, to the ER. So. And a lot of those mechanical things that you can do are found by ultrasound. So that tension pneumo is probably best diagnosed with physical exam and ultrasound. That pericardial tamponade, best diagnosed with physical exam and ultrasound. So, so those are mechanical things you can fix. The problem with the acidosis is once you have such a profoundly acidotic patient, it's really hard to fix yeah. quickly enough because there's a reason you wanted to tube them. This is probably not where a bicarb drip is going to save you. There's physiologic reasons to think that that might actually make them slightly worse in the short term. So what I would do in that case is an awake intubation. Yep. Don't, don't paralyze them. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit of sedation, ketamine, comes to mind. And it'll awake intubation. All right. 